And now it's time for the sponsor perspective portion of our program. Please welcome Peggy Shepard, co-founder and executive director of We Act for Environmental Justice. She's in conversation with Flo McAfee, president of Summerland Studios. Flo, over to you. Hello, I'm Flo McAfee, president of Summerland Studio, a strategic communications firm focused on social impact issues. We work very closely with Climate Action Campaign, CAC, on issues focused on reducing climate pollution and accelerating a just transition to clean energy and a sustainable society that supports justice, jobs, improved health, quality, and quality of life for all. CAC is a coalition of major national environment, environmental justice, and public health groups. One of their invaluable partners is We Act for Environmental Justice. So today joining us is Peggy Shepard, co-founder and president of We Act and co-chair of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Thank you, Peggy, for joining us today and Thank you very much for your partnership with CAC and all the good work that your organization has done on a daily basis throughout the years. So to open this up, I really wanna ask you to really tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got involved, not only in climate and environmental justice, but why you co-founded WEAC. Well, you know, I, I began as a journalist and a magazine editor and used my skills to, to work in political campaigns, uh, especially the Jesse Jackson's uh, first campaign for president, which was a very, very exciting time, uh, organizing the Rainbow Coalition here in New York City and working with young people uh, in every borough. Um, you know, really feeling like we had an opportunity to create a, a new political paradigm. And so that's how I really began uh, working in more of a political uh, environment. We Act got started in 1988 um, because of these uh, campaigns, but also um, our campaign to sue the Metropolitan Transit Authority for building another bus depot in our community. We realized that we housed over one third of the largest diesel bus fleet in the, in the country in our uh, up, uptown neighborhoods in Manhattan. And so we filed a suit there. We were not successful in that lawsuit, but we were able to stop housing being built on top of a bus depot. And so over the years, we have evolved from you know, stopping the bad stuff and being a watchdog to um, being able to work on a full range of environmental issues, centering justice and equity, and really understanding our theory of change, which is to organize the most affected people of color and low income to engage in environmental decision making. I, I think um, what you discuss leads to a really important question that I think we need to help people understand. As you mentioned, in our communities, it's well documented and really visually evident that some of the most polluted environments in America are where people of color live, where they learn, where they work, play, and pray. Could you explain why, um, uh, why that is the case? You know, we have a complex legacy of housing segregation, redlining, land use and zoning, uh, discrimination in so many ways. And we call it environmental racism because polluting facilities have intentionally targeted communities of color for pollution because we are not as knowledgeable about those issues. Our elected officials haven't been active on those issues. And so as a result, there's been discrimination in the enforcement of environmental regulation. Again, the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste disposal and a whole variety of polluting facilities. Um, the continued permitting of polluted facilities in overburdened communities and the exclusion of people of color and low income from the staff and board of mainstream environmental groups that have really created so much of the policy in this community, in this country, um, and also our exclusion from decision-making boards 
and regulatory bodies. And so all of this uh, really comes together in a perfect storm. I think that's interesting, leads to my next question. Um, as a member of the, and as the co-chair of the White House Council, uh, Environmental Justice Advisory Council, and as one who's been in the political arena, what do you um, see the Biden administration's policy priorities around environmental justice and really reaching that pollution-free um, energy infrastructure? Well, I think the centerpiece um, of the Biden administration uh, has been Justice 40. That's certainly um, an initiative that, that so many people have heard about. And that's really an effort to ensure that 40% of the benefits of energy investments go to frontline communities that have been so disinvested uh, in over many, many years. And so that is a way to begin to invest in communities. Invest in what? So invest in um, ensuring that uh, underserved people have good jobs, family sustaining jobs, ensuring that we have the energy efficiencies that we need as we switch from a fossil fuel economy um, to a renewable one, we have to ensure that the most overburdened communities um, are taken into account when we're developing policies. Because we already know 30 million households in this country are already energy insecure. And so when we begin our transition, we have to ensure that that burden uh, does not fall on the most vulnerable communities. Great, and I, th I think that's important too for people to understand and perhaps you can help explain what will be the cost of inaction because um, people over inaction on terms of the climate change and even in environmental justice. I, I think it's helpful for people to understand that too. The cost of inaction is new generations and new families sickened and dying in the cancer alleys that occur across this country. It's Gulf Coast communities of color wiped out by extreme hurricanes and flooding that's not addressed by really oppressive state governments that are not allocating um, equal funds to clean up and mitigate uh, climate change and extreme weather events in communities of color. It's really understanding that if vulnerable communities are not represented in environmental decision making, our communities will continue uh, to be left out of the new energy economy and will continue to be overburdened by polluting facilities. My last two questions is, number one, then how can communities and how does we act help communities get involved and be active and what can they do? And then the final will be, um, how, what can Congress do? That's always to address the issue. So what can communities do? Um, there are hundreds of grassroots groups like We Act for Environmental Justice around this country. Uh, we Act is a membership-based organization. It's not enough just to organize people, but you've got to help them, inform them, train them to tell their story in a way that the media and policymakers um, can, can hear it best. Um, engage them in decision making, in lobbying and educating their officials, uh, bringing them to Washington to tell their story to Congress. So all of that is really important if we're going to fully integrate regular people who are most affected by these issues uh, into policy making. And then certainly Congress, um, Congress has a responsibility to fully represent all of our communities. And that has not been happening. We have a number of progressive bills pending in Congress that need to be passed. The environmental justice for all bill is very important. Um, it would really create um, 
the, the kinds of engagement, the kinds of enforcement, the kinds of funding that is absolutely ne desperately needed in our communities. Thank you so much, Peggy. This has really been informative and really helpful. Could Just before we close, could you remind people of how they can find out more about WE Act um, and where they could go? <laughs> Well, absolutely. Uh, you can always join WE Act as a member. Uh, we have monthly membership meetings and working groups around climate justice and healthy homes. Um, you can go to our website at weact.org uh, and find out more about us. Um, and we also engage grassroots groups from around the country in an environmental justice leadership forum uh, that also um, has meetings and annual convenings. So um, we'd love to have you all involved, but at least get involved in your locality. There are groups in, in your city and town uh, that are working on these issues. Find them and, and work with them. Thank you so much. And on behalf of um, CAC, I want to remind you, if you want to learn about what we do, go to actonclimate.org and you can find out more. Thank you so much, Peggy, for joining us today. Thank you. Great discussion. Thank you both.